So this is lecture 16 of 5312, okay? And so what we're doing in this lecture is we're trying to build upon what we saw in the last three lectures in terms of the different types of optimal receiver designs. We looked at sort of a Uh, correlator based based implementations. So what we're going to be looking in lecture 16 right now is it's kind of a smattering of topics, but it's the end result that I'm kind of interested in. Okay. So what we're going to be doing is first of all we're going to touch upon a little bit about the parallel realization of a match filter. Okay. And then we're going to talk about what happens if you have a wild card in your signal transmission parameter. For instance, what happens if you have a noise? How sort of like very topical treatments. We can we can go into lots of detail, but the real sort of message I want to con And that's really important because that forms now the foundation for what we're going to be doing tonight, which is creating expressions for probability of bit error. This is sort of like, like everyone, everyone should be looking forward to this. That's why I'm so excited, you know. So, so that's what we're going to do. And then lectures 17 and 18 build upon this. So 17, we'll talk, to, we'll talk about the vectorization, the vector diagram for determining the probability of bit error. And then last but not least, in the last segment, we'll actually look at um, how we can use that, that vector diagram in order to drive uh, these expressions for the probability of bit error uh, based solely in sort of the geometry, if you will, of the, the transmitted symbols versus, let's say, what we're expecting, right? And it all becomes distance, right? So before we jump into pro probability of bit error, Let's sort of revisit our match filter realization. So in the last class, we saw what happened, right? So in the last class, I'm just going to bring it up on the projector. What we saw was the following. What we saw is, suppose I have a waveform that looked like this. So let's say that's 0, and that's t, that's 1. And this is my signal waveform, let's say S of t. It turns out that the optimal matched filter for this guy turns out, OK, so let's say we do H opt of t will be equal to S t minus t. So what is this? It is a rotation. It's a, it, you flip it around the y-axis and shift by t to the right. If we do that here, what you get is, first of all, let's say we do the flip. Minus, let's say that's t over 2, and that's 0. And then the next step is we now shift this by t to the right. So you get this. So this is our h optimal for the st, right? And so how do we use this? Well, if we design our waveforms differently, so let's say that's s1 of t, OK? And I have an s2 of t. its h optimal is going to be quite different, right? It's going to look like, so that's h optimal 1. Uh, mixing up colors, bad me. And then here is 0 to t over 2. That is my h optimal 2 t, right? And so you might wonder how is it employed? And the answer is simple. You convolve one with the other. 
You can involve one of these guys. So, so I choose rectangular. These pulse shapes can be anything, but the reason rectangular is what happens when you convolve two rectangular you get this beautiful triangular pulse twice the width of the original rectangular pulse right and what what is really important to note is where it peaks it peaks at T so if let's say we return to this guy the way this would work is the following oh come on is if I take let's say my incoming signal And let's say my impulse So what it should look like when I convolve the two in the time domain is that at T, if you do time domain convolution, so what you have is T over 2, then you have 3T over 2, and you have a triangle. And your receiver samples there. That's why it's peak SNR maximizing. What happens is we'll have noise and bad stuff there. That's not a problem. The noise will stay there. But my signal will be enhanced at a single point, and which filter we use. So you might say, how do I realize this? The same way you would do with a correlator based re realization. What you would do. And I think I'm going to upset people because I'm just going to delete this. No, yes. Oh, no, I don't want to save. So I'm buying some time. OK, don't save. OK, the way this would work is essentially if I have a signal coming in. So let's say we take those, that example, right? So let's say I have SI, mystery signal SI. I don't know which one it is. And then I pass it through this guy. What ends up happening is, so let's say this guy is that, this guy is that, k equal, uh, sorry, t equals k big T, and same thing there, t equals k t, and then you choose max. If your name is max, then you probably are called upon a lot. And so what happens is, suppose I have, let's, let's say this incoming, let's say I change that a little bit. So suppose I have the following. Um, so let's say if I have this waveform, right? So what will happen um, at this instant? What will it look like? It would be a triangle, right? And it's going to peak at T like that. How about here? What's going to happen at this guy? It too will be a triangle, right? But it's not going to peak at T, right? It's going to peak. If you do t uh, continuous time convolution, that guy is in fact, when you shift and shift and shift and shift and shift, it's actually going to peak if I'm Please correct me if I'm wrong. It's been a long time since I've done continuous time convolution. T over 2. And then it goes down at T. But when we, let's say, choose max, choose max is going to look at, OK, what's happening at T? What's happening at T? Ah, that's a peak. That's a 0. I'm going to choose the top one. And you would be right. But then successively after that, you have the next symbol. <gasps> And the next symbol. So this guy is convolving like nonstop. And um, you know, that would be a really cool quiz question to ask. Like 20 symbols. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You guys are gonna say, Professor, that new car you bought, oh, that those tires are gone. Yes, yes. Uh, there was actually one professor I remember many years ago. He had like a really old car. This was like 1999, and his car was from, like from 1980. And the reason why he had it, he had two cars. He had a good car and he had a bad car. He brought the bad car to work because ever so often someone would throw a trash can through the windshield or cut the tires or something. He didn't care. He kept the good car at home. Yeah, I should talk with my wife about boring her car. So, anyways, um, so where does this come? Like, how is this used? Okay, 
So the bank realization. So you can do this with m possible symbols, right? You can do it just like the correlator realization. Sample, 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 sample. Something. There is a bias with the symbols, okay? Now, what you want to do is the following. How would this look like? And I drew an example here on the slides because for me to draw it on the uh, electronic pad mm, might not turn out so nicely. So this, this required a little bit of concerted effort. This is what convolution would look like of rectangular pulses, the ones that we just talked about, running them right through this realization for, in this case, we're convolving it against one of the possible n, let's say, implementations, uh, fingers, if you will, of your filter realization at the receiver. And what happens is, notice how you have a max at t, you, you have a max at 2t, you don't have a max at 3t, you got like negative e, no dice, right? What happens is, like, uh, so, so, so what you would have is essentially, hmm, how would I draw this? Like over time, so let's say we go back to this realization. I'm going to do a little bit of erasing. The way this would work is essentially you would have a string of these guys coming in. You would essentially have, let's say, that's 0, t, 2t, 3t, 4t, dot, 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 right? Let's say the first one is like this. The second one's like this. The third one is like this. The fourth one is like this, right? And you feed them into both branches. OK, this we're going to have to really be careful of because, again, this is a law of convolution, right? So how would this look like? At this branch here, right? And at this branch here, how would this look like? So let's say I convolve this guy with this guy. So let's see. So 0, t, 2t, 3t, right? And same thing here, 0, t, 2t, 3t. So what we would have is the first guy would, be convol would convolve, and he would peak there, right? And this guy would peak midway. Now the next guy is kind of an interesting story. So what happens is we're convolving. So how, how, we would do, how would we do this here? Well, what happens is, remember how convolution works. One of the signals, rotate. So, so flip and shift by t. So and then what you do is you shift, 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 multiply, add, multiply, add, multiply, add. And you record, basically, temporally, as you shift along, um, what, what the result is, right? And that gives you the triangle. So the next guy, so let's say we take um, the second symbol here, would actually peak at 2t. And why is that? You, you essentially flip him around the y-axis, but not at that point. Basically, if the y-axis started at t, you flip him, rotate him around t, and then you shift him by t. And then what you do is, if he collides with this guy here, you, he actually misses. He doesn't peak at 2t at this branch, but he'll peak at 2t here. In fact, I'm trying to think, where would he peak there? Hmm. I think, if I'm not mistaken, he peaks midway, right? So notice what's happening. So this guy is obviously the upper symbol. So this, this branch here takes care of S1 of t and says, ah, you got an S1 of t in that symbol period. And this one says, if you have an S2 in that symbol period in that branch. So what these guys are, they're, they're flagging. So all, they want, all they're doing is, OK, at the sampler, it's like, OK, I've got that, and I've got that. And then here I got that, and I got that. And you keep on going. And you can see where this is going. And so, OK, at time t, 
What do I got? Oh, this guy's maximum. Boom, S1 and that symbol period. And then the next one, boom, the bottom branch has the peak. And it just makes these decision calls. Like every, every T seconds, who's bigger? So what ends up happening is the output here will be would be two and uh, am I right? Doo -doo 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 -doo. Or am I messing up altogether? Oh God! But I think people are so people understand what I what I mean to say here, right? So what happens is if you have a cascade, and you might say, do the signals really look like this? No, they actually add. That's what makes this very complicated. Let's say if I use this pink superimpo superimposer thing, what you get because convolution is a linear operation. And then we have multiple symbols added on top of each other. So they literally combine. So every convolution output of every symbol adds together. And what we get essentially is something that looks like this. If we transmit two symbols, same thing here. Not, not as exciting. But what happens is, just like what we have on the doc cam over here, so these guys. And this is what your match filter is doing. It's basically a little rectangular wave. What you end up getting is a superposition of all those triangular waveforms. And then it's, is it a max? Is it a max? Is it a max? Is it a max? Right? On all those branches, every T. And comes to is what we submit in that simple epoch. All right? Whew. Yeah, the only thing is continuous time convolution is not fun, right? Discrete time is easy. It's like you have a lot of stem, but the continuous time you have to shift. Yes? Um, if it's the same as the correlator, um, not, not quite, because what happens is what we're trying to do is the correlator is trying to see how much information one symbol has in the match filter, on the other hand, what it's trying to do is it's trying to sort of enhance the signal as best it can under the conditions with noise presence. So, so, so conceptually, correlator says, how much do these two signals match, uh, not match, uh, how much do these two signals have in common with each other? And the match filter, on the other hand, is it's designed specifically to create a peak. If it, It's almost like... Um, um, I don't. I really don't know how to describe it. So we're like, like if this feed the signal at time t, it will be the largest possible output on that branch across all branches. But in some ways, you're right because what happens is what we're doing is the filter design is specific to the desired symbol we're trying to match with. So we're hoping that the maximizing correlation, the deterministic waveform correlation, but but we're not we're not. Correlation. We're really just like we choose a filter that results in the signal being the possible value it can against all possible po input waveforms to it. Okay, good question. All right, so that's that concludes match filtering. Now, the next step. Oh boy, and this is. Like, I'll get there. I'll get there. I'll get there. You should know a little bit about optimal. Right? Anybody here dealing with like random phase channels? Random phase people? A little bit, right? The satellite communications. So, what happens is what we've looked at so far. Is the case where what happens are oops <laughs> as much as I like that it does right and we know that this is random random and this guy here is deterministic right we know that it could only be one of several combinations our receiver knows it our transmitter uses it. We need to figure out which one, right? And this guy, by virtue of the fact that we have a random sequence, random signal 
embedded with that deterministic signal is also random. But this is sort of like an additive scenario, right? Where, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is additive. What I'm interested in is suppose on top of this, we also have other sort of impairments. For instance, what happens if we have this like unpleasant random parameter called A? So now I have SI, T, A. And suppose one case is something like fading. How would fade? Fading is unknown, right? It's the environment. How is fading caused? It's caused by a receiver point in space, and they're constructively and destructively combining, multipath fading. So how would that look like? Like that. A little multipl multiplicative thing. It attenuates, and then it increases, and stuff. Another. is suppose you have the following. Let's say we call A here, and then we have, it's equal to A, some amplitude, but that's not random, cosine 2 pi F C of T plus A, and A is some sort of phase term. So what happens is we have a random, it rotates our signal, and so imagine you're a phase shift keying. That's problematic, right? Unless you're doing differential, right? If you use differential shape, uh, phase shift keying, then shift keying, excessive symbols coming in, what the difference between them are, not necessarily their absolute. So for instance, with BPSK, or QPSK is a, a great example, well, what happens is, depending on what their absolute phase is, that is their symbol. Whereas with differential, it's really sort of the relativistic. It's like, here's one incoming symbol, and then the next one, and really what we're looking at, their difference tells us what the previous guy and what the next guy and what the next guy is. So if you have a really serious issue with, with phase, you use the BPSK, the QPSK, and, and such. So ask anyone who's doing my software-defined course, DPS, those, those radios. So. What happens is amplitude and phase are definitely issues. And you might, you might say, OK, so what do we do? What do we do? How do, how do we fix this thing? And the answer is what happens is um, you, you essentially, so let's actually head back. Let's, so what happens is, remember we had like um, before. So what was the decision rule? So we have the probability that SI was transmitted given that we observed rho, right? Is greater than or equal to. And remember that we generalize this. If we have M symbols, we choose the one that maximizes this conditional probability based on the observation. Now, what, what's it really interesting? Notice that, like, you know, we have these probabilities. Well, let's take this one step further. So suppose A has its own PDF. What we could do. This, so this is the trick in probability. So people say, okay, what sort of probability I need for this course, okay? This is a trick. When you have multiple random variables in your expression, you use conditional probability. You have one that's random, and you assume everything else is known. It's fixed. And that way, you sort of tear it apart, and you treat it piecemeal. So what you do is you say, let's say in our case. So this is not our case. Get rid of that. Our case, you have the observed, and you also have A. Right? And then you also have So what this tells me is that I hold a constant. But, but I can't leave it like that. 
Oh, no, 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 I can't leave that like that. No, 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 no. So what do I do? What happens is, so this tells me for a specific value of A, I will find out what the probability of SI being transmitted given that I observe rho and given a specific A. Oh, specific A. Suppose A, A, has a PDF of A. What do I do? What I can do, so here's some of the crazy notation, is I can, what I can do is I can take the average across the A's for this guy. So basically what I do, 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 I think my notation's a little sloppy, my apologies. But what you can do is in order to find, let's say, the probability of SI given rho, what happens is you, you basically average across all A values that probability given rho and A, right? So what you, what you essentially do is how do you do that? Well, that's going to be equal to from minus infinity to infinity, right? Um, that and that, and then the probability of A, right? It's PDF, sorry, PDF of A, uh, dA, right? So what you're doing is you're essentially saying, okay, I'm going to I'm going to consider this. Probability specific A, I multiply it, I weigh them, I average them out, right? And you do, you do this very much with either amplitudes, with phase, with whatever is random signal. So in, if we go back to the doc camp, you know, so, so we go to the next slide, what you, you can do is like way in the slides. What happens is here, exactly that. What happens is you assign it to some sort of function, g i of a, and then you average that. That's exactly what I wrote, wrote. And so what you do at the end of the day, you can also, the little trick, okay, step two. So step one we saw. Step two, the mixed Bayes rule, what happens is a still stays in a condition, right? A is still held fast, but I switch around the row and the SI. It's still legit. And so what happens is when I do that and I work it through, it's actually interesting. Now what I have is now I have a conditional PDF that's conditioned on SI and conditioned on A. Same magic. Same magic. It doesn't matter because at the end of the day, averaging across all the A's. So, so if you do that. You know, you can do a lot of things. Like if you have a nagging amplitude or phase situation, like I've alluded to just before, that that's easy. And and I think the thing is, the math becomes a little bit could be a little bit difficult, but what ends up happening is this takes care of, let's say, the non-additive distortion that's introduced to your signal. So we talk about noise channels. Oh, but then we have attenuation, some sort of fading, block fading, flat fading, frequencies electric fading, time varying fading, blah, 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 or phase rotations, phase distortions, and, and, and such. Perhaps we even have a little bit of jitter due to a bad clock. Oh, jitter of you. What happens is all of that can be characterized by a random variable. And then what we do is we average it out. Because ultimately what I care about is the average, right? I don't care. Like, that's the thing. None of you should, be, should fall into the trap of looking for the instantaneous sort of solution. We always care about, like, you know, like, you know for instance, like if, you, if your boss, you're working for a cell phone company,
average bid error rate over the last several weeks. And then, you know, then you, so we across all possible scenarios, like, you know, what is the average, right? Because not over the long haul. All right, so yeah, so that's what I mean by smathering, right? So I talked a little bit about match filter design. I talked a little about optimal rec receivers with unknown parameters thrown in. So conceptually, this is all cool. So now, ha, ah, this is the part I really This is where we start talking about probability of errors. This is where, you know, the, the intimidating Q-looking thing in that, those equations. Like, you know, you go to a communications conference or you go to a communications professor or a communications friend and say, yeah, yeah, P is equal to Q, blah, blah, blah. And you say, wow, where, what's that Q? It's intimidating. It's almost as intimidating as Bessel functions, right? J naught, I naught. It's like, wow. Like, I remember when I was an undergrad and I took that course, I, I thought Bessel functions were like, you know, uh, my, my, like, you know, sort of like, uh, like, tormentor, if you will, because I couldn't understand them. Here, um, Q is going to be your friend. Q is the shortcut because you don't have to solve brute force uh, what is the integral of a Gaussian because there's no close form solution. So what happens is we go back to our hypothesis, um, uh, sort of like, sorry, uh, sort of like we, we have these two hypotheses, H1 and H0. And what H1 say is essentially, is S1 present in this noisy signal, or is S2 present in this signal? And we saw what the advantages of playing in waveform space are, and what it is when we play in the vector domain. So, so we have these hypotheses, and what we want to do is, let's say we have, we have the waveform representation with the vector representation which is this guy here. And so what we're going to look at for class is we're going to sort of, like, we, we touched upon this a little bit before when we talked about the vectorization of various types of modulation schemes. Now we're going to go in depth. So we talked a little bit about this. We talked about what R is represented. In fact, what is R? The vector and a symbol vector. And what, what we'll look at is if we translate this, oh, oh I'm going to say a bad word, trigon trigonometry. <gasps> what happens is when we translate No surprises. You have the waveform representation, and we can do everything in waveform space, and we'll get the exact same answer, but it might be a bit tedious and not intuitive, or we can play around in vectors. So we play around in vectors. First thing, let's go back to our good old friend decision rule, right? Decision rule, so on the left side, is the waveform version, we want to find out the, the, the correlation between RT, the received vector, sorry, received signal, and S1 of T. So what do you do? Multiply the two together and integrate. This is the definition of correlation, right? So how much information of R is contained, uh, how much S1 is contained in R? We hope that we design S1 and S2 properly. In fact, later in this lecture and in the next, what we'll find out is, as communications engineers, that they will be like night and that's an S1. You sure? Oh yeah, I'm pretty sure. That's what we want. Like, you know, we want our rate. And so our decision rule is we find out how much of S1 is contained in R. And if we transmit an S1, then that 
correlation should be way bigger than when we correlate R with S2. How much S2 is contained in R? So if we've done our job correctly and we chose S2 perfectly, that should be true. And what's going to happen is I'm going to be the pessimist, which is my normal mode. I might be all happy and chipper, but most of the time, if you ask my wife, she'll say, oh my god, do you ever have anything happy to say? And in this lecture, I'm going to have to rain on your parades because what we're going to do is we're not going to talk about what is the probability of correct, correctly receiving stuff. We're going to talk about the probability of having an error glass half empty. Mm. Okay. The vector side? So, what we want to do is what is the error situation? So, okay, now we're getting negative. Okay, no one get depressed. Okay. What is the error situation? It's opposite to what we thought was correct, right? So, we sent an S1, but wait, but wait, R is correlating more with S2. <coughs> Wrong, right? What does that translate into? Bad if you're transmitting video. This is the really cool part of this part of the course. We are going to direct. And we're just going to delve in, and you know, maybe that's a good sanity check for everyone. Okay. So what happens is, you know, we can we can do it this way. So what happens is, it's the same thing. Oh no 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 no! Come back here. So it's the same old premise. So what's our decision? Okay. So. Integrate from 0 to t, r of t, with s1 of t, dt. And the decision rule, what we want to happen is this. Let's suppose we assume just two signals. And we assume that s1 of t is transmitted. Okay? So this is good. No error. Happy face. <laughs> Happy face. Now, what happens is when this happens, oh, that's bad. That means this is the error situation. Okay? That's not happy. So, what do we do? What happens is, let's expand this a little bit. During my office hours, I think we did a little bit of this, but let's, let's, let's do this a bit more. Okay? So, what happens is, the first thing you do is you take this guy and you say, what is he equal to? He, because we transmitted S1 and has noise added to it, is equal to S1 of t plus n of t. And here, too. Now, if we now expand that, what you get is this. You get S1 of t. That should be a 1, folks. S1 of t, dt. And then we have plus 0 to t, n of t, S1 of t, dt, less than or equal to S1 of t, S2 of t, dt, plus 0 to t, n of t, s2 of t, dt. And you might say, OK, so what? What happens is, first of all, we, we do a few things. So first of all, this guy here is the energy of signal 1, right? We correlate it with itself. It gives us the energy. What else do we see? Well, I see this term here. This guy is the correlation between s1 and s2. So that is rho 1, 2. And these guys here 
we're going to group together because it's a linear operation. So if we do that, ah, sorry. We get that, and that should be less than or equal to uh, 0 to t, n of t, s2 of t, minus s1 of t, dt. Okay? And so what we want, let's say we call this guy, we call this guy, Z, or in Canada and England, Z. <laughs> so what happens is we want to know what is the distribution of Z, Z, whatever you want to call it, right? So what we want to do is we know that N of T is AWGN. We know what these guys' properties are. Let's dig in deep. B should be equal to, and in fact, that's actually derived. So if we go back, we have this guy, and the first thing we see off the top of our heads is that this guy is going to be zero mean. And you might say, how did you get that? And the way I know, I, I'm, I'm, I have to go back to the whiteboard. This is how you get it. There we go. The way you get that is you take what is the expectation of z? That's going to be the expectation of the integral from 0 to t, n of t, and then s2 of t minus s1, ah, s2 of t, s1 of t, dt. And what happens is because the expectation and the integration are linear operators, we can interchange. s2 and s1 are deterministic, but n is random. We bring E to the inside and only apply it to the random stuff. And lo and behold, because it's zero mean noise, the entire thing goes to zero, which means this entire thing goes to zero. Now, what we want to do is we want to find the core. What is so if we go back to the talk cam, what happens is we take the definition for the variable squared. This only works when the mean is zero. If it's not, is, is not just the, uh, we have to subtract off the mean in order to make it the variance. So it would be z minus m, if that's the mean, and that squared in order to get uh, the, the variance. But because it's zero mean, it, that's a mute point. So we just use z squared. So what you do is the exact same thing. Go back. So you take that guy, and what you'll find is that, well, actually, when we squared, we're going to have two integrals. Right? So what we're going to get is, let's say we do this. So we're going to have n of t and n of tau. Better keep the time variables separate. Tau minus s1 of tau d tau. Now, what happens is you bring the two guys together. So what you're, you'll get is E, integrate from 0 to t, 0 to t, n t, n tau, and then you're going to have these two things together, but don't worry about that just quite yet. Oh, I think I screwed up. 
there we go. That's right. dt, d tau. And then, just like before, take this guy and apply it to bring it in, because it's linear operators. It applies to this group only. And what do we know about the noise? It is white, which means it's uncorrelated with any other time instant, but it's tau has to be equal to t, which means So what we end up getting is the end, end of the day, we have, um, we have a variance term right, that comes out 0 to t. And then we have s2 of t minus s1 of t squared dt. right? And so if we go back to the what happens is we can expand this out. We've, we've seen Energies are identical. And so what gives us, at the end, what this gives us, we can rip and tells me is that the variance of my signal now is um, of noise that has been multiplied by the signals and then integrated is equal to the power spectral density of the noise times the energy minus the correlation between the two signals. Yeah. Because why do we need this? Because what happens is we're going to use that. Like remember our, if we go back to what our expression was like before, Remember, it was E1 minus rho 1, 2 is less than or equal to Z. Is that correct? Right? Now, what happens is, what is So what happens is, what do we know about these things? What, what does this mean? So if we have a Gaussian, it is zero mean, right? It has a variance, right? What happens is, what does this guy tell me? What is the probability that the random variable produces a value, right? This is our random variable, RV, produces a value. I'm trying to think, is it, um, so no, I'm trying to think of it the other way. Yep. So produces a value that's greater than or equal to E1 minus rho 1, 2. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I got kind of confused there. So what does that look like? It looks like this. There, folks, is E1 minus rho 1, 2. It is the area underneath the curve all the way to infinity. This. And so that's why the Q function is so important. The Q function here, really what happens is, is, is way, instead of just the integral of a Gaussian PDF, because what you would, you would integrate your PDF from this guy to plus infinity. The Q function, if you just put, you have Q and you have the argument represent. What do I mean? This is what I mean. Check it out. So the Q function has this form, the basic Q function. 1 over square root of 2 pi integrate from x to plus infinity e to the minus y squared divided by 2 dy. You it's totally. What happens, is, what happens is what we're left out, we've left out here is the sigma squareds. We left out, if there's a non-zero mean Gaussian, we left it out of the y. What happens is, you
in case you want to do MATLAB, and now MATLAB has Q functions, but in the old days, I mean really old days, like when I was, what happens is you use the complementary error. All right? And so there's those beautiful tail probabilities I'm telling you about. And what happens is when you compute the probability of error using those Q functions. So, so where did I get this guy from? Essentially, this is an exercise for all of you. What happens is solve for this integral. So this integral, we're integrating from E right, to infinity. What? Thank you. I'm like wondering, I said, like, what do you mean you don't see? It's like, are you okay? Should I get an ambulance? Like, I can't. No, no. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Jesus. I need sleep. Okay, so what happens is you have this, you have that, e to the minus blah, let's say call it x, and then dx, right? So now what happens is, is this the form of a q function? No. So we have this thing, but that's just a constant. And we have this thing, which we need to deal with, too. So you do what they call a change of variables. And when you do that, it will end up that you will get a Q function that's equal to this, which you do a little bit of manipulation. You square and square root it. So as I like to say, you're doing nothing. Ha, ha, ha. Then what happens is you know that sigma squared is equal to n naught e minus rho 1, 2. Plug it back in. You have this expression. So what we're going to do is chapter 17, we're going to see, like the thing is, where do we have power to maximize, or sorry, minimize the probability of error? And so how does a Q function work? Well, what happens is the smaller the value in the Q function, right? Um, so let me think. Smaller the value or larger the value? No, no, no. What am I thinking? So the larger the value in the Q function, the smaller the output. So if the input is as large as possible, we're going to get the smallest possible output, right? That's the desired result. Why? I want the smallest possible error. Can I change the energy of the signal? Yeah, you can do that. Can I change the noise? Well, unless you have some superpowers I'm not aware of, we can totally change the correlation between S1 and S2, all right? So with that, uh, that concludes lecture Lecture, um, lecture 16. Okay.